A whisper of A whisper peace, of peace moving, through the land. moving through the Allah land Allah will surely Allah run to us, surely us But do we understand A word of hope A call to A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir Rahman Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu The brothers, I didn't hear your deep baritone voice. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Jazakumullah khairan. I find myself truly honored and humbled once again to be sharing the platform with some of the superstars of the Islamic world. I sometimes pinch myself for my blessings. Allah has been very merciful. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm actually here as a student just like you. I'm here to learn and grow from these great speakers. Let me tell you a little bit about my childhood. I grew up in a home where there was so much love, so much compassion, laughter, and happiness. We were a very, very close-knit family. We still are. My parents modeled great Islamic conduct, and they taught us too. There was a very strong emphasis while growing up on being self-disciplined, being, having good manners and good conduct. My parents also taught us the importance of service, being useful not only to ourselves, but being useful to others. Little, little did I know then that the things I witnessed growing up would come in very useful in how I relate with my spouse, how we are raising our children, and how we are building our home. Now many of us get married, have children, and just go with the flow wherever it takes us. There is a quote from Zaid Parvez where he says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. If you don't have any sense of direction for your marriage or how to raise your children, then it doesn't matter where things end up. If your marriage isn't going according to plan, well, you didn't have plans in the first place. If your children aren't growing up with the morals and the values you had hoped for, well, you didn't have plans on how you wanted to raise them and what qualities you wanted them to imbibe. For us to build a beautiful home, have a great, fulfilling relationship with our spouse, raise children that are not only God-conscious, but useful to themselves and society, it takes a lot of effort. It takes hard work, commitment from both you and your spouse, and a lot of prayers. Now, due to time, I'm going to talk about three areas our relationship with our spouse, parenting and raising children, and our relationship with our parents. Now, marriage and parenting requires a true partnership, ideally both parties being fully 110% involved and committed in raising the children. Often, sadly, the reality is quite different. Sometimes you find some couples dropping the ball, where one partner does all the work, one partner is the one putting in all the efforts to make the marriage work and raise the children. Almost you would think they are a single parent. Now, it's not compulsory to get married, though highly, highly encouraged. However, once we choose to get married, we have a huge role and a responsibility, like Brother Muhammad Salah just shared with us. We have rights and we also have our obligations. However, so does our spouse. Once we sign that contract in the presence of Allah, then we will have to answer to him for what we did and what we didn't do. If one doesn't know one's rights, unfortunately, ignorance is not an excuse. Call Brother Muhammad if you need to, but you need to start reading, asking questions, and doing your homework so that you will not go and face Allah and say, I didn't know. It's also not compulsory to have children. Again, it's highly encouraged. But they didn't choose you to be their parents. They didn't ask to be born. They are a gift to us from Allah. However, we didn't choose their personality and we didn't choose their character. They are a gift to us, but Allah says that they are also a trial to us. But like Brother Mufti once said in one of his lectures, we can also be a trial to our children. Did we have plans on how we want to raise our children? Are we conscious of our behavior that they may replicate, either the good or the bad? What seeds are we planting in our children? What gifts are we giving them, 
seeds and gifts of a good tarbiyah, gifts of a holistic education, gifts of going beyond raising A-class students to hopefully nurturing and developing A-class human beings. Just as they will be called to account for how they took care of us in our old age, we will also have to answer to Allah for how we raise them. And if we fail at this huge responsibility of parenting, if we drop the ball or neglect our responsibilities, we could create dysfunctional children. Children who grow up to be a problem to their spouse and their children. Children who grow up to become a menace to society. Like I often say, Hitler and all those who have committed atrocities since time be began all had parents. Something went wrong during their upbringing. For some of us, our parents did a fantastic job raising us. They raised us in an environment where we grew up to see love, compassion, mutual growth, communication, and God consciousness. They taught us about the importance of service and contribution and living a useful life, a life of purpose. If we were so fortunate to have experienced or witnessed that, it makes it so much easier for us to replicate that in our homes and improve upon it. For some of us, it's a different story. In some families, you find stories similar to those of some of the prophets whose family members were their trial. Some, the problem may be from the parent, like Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. For others, it could be their spouse, like Lut, Ayub, and Nuh alayhi salam. For others, it could be their children or other relatives or uncles, and we all know those stories. How do we know and how do we ensure that we do not replicate with our spouse in our homes and in our children those things that while we were growing up, we resented that we knew were wrong? How do we make sure that our guidance is from being God conscious, that our guidance is from the principles of Islam and not other people's mistakes or shortcomings? How do we fulfill our roles as husbands and wives so that we can continue to achieve greater peace and tranquility? And how do we fulfill our roles as parents to mold our children to become useful not only to themselves but also to society? We have to start somewhere. One thing I always say is you cannot share and you cannot teach what you don't know and what you don't have. If you don't have yourself in order, what are you going to contribute to someone else? Even if our parents didn't do a good job, we have to recognize that and we have to start somewhere. We are now responsible and will be held accountable for ourselves and our obligations. Something that helped me in my home as a wife and as a parent is that I knew I had a lot of shortcomings. In fact, I had too many shortcomings, and I've shared that with many during some of my lectures, is that I recognized that I needed to start somewhere, and that somewhere was with me. Early on in my marriage, my focus had always been on my needs not being met and pointing fingers. It was always his fault. It was always him not doing this or that, and that I wasn't happy. I was extremely selfish early in the relationship, and I've shared again how we were really head over heels in love, and yes, as Brother Muhammad had mentioned just before he left, that we have expectations, but once you get married, the realities can be quite different. A wake-up call for me was when my husband one day told me that he wasn't looking forward to coming home to me. It hurt. Now, this isn't why we got married. And this isn't what a happy home was meant to be. I didn't realize that my constant complaints and nagging and whining made my husband feel inadequate. The fact that I fought, and I fought hard using my greatest weapon of mass destruction, my mouth, made him angry. The fact that I didn't look good, for good in anything he did, I didn't compliment, I didn't show appreciation, made him feel that he wasn't good enough for me. My lack of interest in his hobbies, the things he liked to do, made him feel lonely. Now you see, if you 
do not fulfill your spouse's needs, wants, and fantasies, you run a high risk of chasing them out to go and fulfill it elsewhere. Now, it took Saeed and I about five to six years of terrible fights. We literally had reached rock bottom where divorce was actually on the table. Before we sat down and started to ask ourselves, what is it we really wanted from this relationship? And that this, this thing we had, is not why we got married. So we sat down and talked. I started with myself. I asked my husband to tell me, what is it about me that he doesn't like, that he wants me to change? And what is it about me that he likes, that he wants me to continue or improve upon? However, I asked him to be merciful, that he shouldn't break me while speaking to me. He shouldn't tell me things that will make me feel very small. Fortunately for me, he responded very positively. And it was really hard. It's very hard hearing the truth about yourself. But I also asked him to remind me tactfully because a lot of the problems we had were habits that I had developed over so many years and would take time to break. But alhamdulillah for me, my husband asked me to do exactly the same with him. And this was the real turning point in our relationship, in the marriage. And this is what worked for us. We started to focus on building ourselves and strengthening our nafs. We started to read books on personal growth, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and we talked about it openly. We shared anything new that we had learned. I learned to become very, very self-aware, to do a lot of straight talk with myself, or from where I come from, we call it talk grrr with yourself. I would ask myself sincerely, would I want to be married to someone just like me? Would I want to be married to me? Sincerely, am I attractive both inside and out? Now, I work really hard to make the outlook good because I want him to find me attractive. The good thing for me, alhamdulillah, is he joins me for my walks, going to the gym. We play mean tennis together, and he joins me in my exercises. But I focus on building the in. Why? Because after age and gravity prove that they really exist, it is the in that really makes us truly beautiful. A few weeks ago, I was going on a journey, and before I left, I went to say goodbye to my parents. And my mother, she's quite old and not well, but there was something she said that struck me that day. She said that Baba was very kind to her that day. So I quickly ran and met him, and I told him, I said, Mommy said good things about you. He sat back in his chair and asked me to sit on the floor. And then he said, Wallahi Maryam, even after 50 years, every single day I thank Allah for this gift of this woman that is not only beautiful to look at, but beautiful to, in, to be inside. And I ask myself, what did I do to, to deserve such a beautiful gift from him? It is my prayer that hopefully my husband and I will continue to enjoy this well into our old age, just like them. So I ask myself more questions. Is my character attractive? Am I a good person? Have I done my purification of my soul? Am I a pleasure to be around? Is my presence felt in the home? When I'm there, do I bring this positive energy? I make it a point to be the sunshine in the house. Every time I come, I try to make sure I give positive words of affirmation and feedback. I love that even my children say that when I'm around, they feel the sunshine. And my husband says when I travel, he reminds me that there is this song, Ain't No Sunshine When You're Gone. And he said that's what he remembers about me. Alhamdulillah, this is really very encouraging. But what I love even more is even after 27 years of marriage, whenever my husband is coming home, even if it's just from work or from a journey, I find myself getting all excited. I find myself taking an extra effort to look fresh and clean, and I welcome him at the door. I also ask myself more questions while I'm doing my grrr talk. I ask, do I add value to my spouse and to the relationship? How do I lift his spirits up? Am I encouraging of him? 
Am I a pleasure to be around? Am I sufficiently grateful to Allah for this gift that we have together? And is Allah pleased with me? And most importantly, I ask, would I want to come home to someone like me? I ask you to please do the same. Whether you're married or not, once you get married, these are important questions you need to ask yourself. Ask yourself questions like, do you look forward to coming home now? Is this how you pictured and had a vision of what your marriage would be like? How your children would be? How your home would be? What role did you have to play to make it this way? If it's good, how did you help to make it this good? And if it isn't the way you had hoped, what role did you have to play to make it this way? And then what areas can you improve upon? What can you do differently? I'd like you to go with me on a journey and just imagine a scenario that a doctor tells you, you have six months to live a healthy life and then your life will come to an end. I'd like you to ask yourself these questions. What are the most important contributions you want to make to your spouse and to the family? Then ask your children, what are the most important lessons you want to teach them? Ask yourself, what are the most important lessons you want to teach your children? And which qualities and which examples of yours would you want to make sure they never forget? Now we're talking within six months here. What guarantees do you have that you will live to see another year? Another month? Another day? Are you ready to say goodbye to your children and to your spouse right now? And are you ready to face Allah? This wasn't an easy exercise, and I did it with my husband. I sat with him and I sat with the children separately, and I asked these questions. I asked my husband, what are the most important contributions that I have made to you and to the family? Then I asked my kids separately, what are the most important lessons that mama has ever taught you? And what qualities, what examples of mine will you never forget? I ask you to do the same because the feedback may surprise you. It gives you a chance to do a quick inventory to see whether you are on track. The answers to these kind of questions and more give me a sense of direction and a purpose. And it helps us live each day deliberately, guided by the goals that we have for each other and for the marriage. Now that we have a compass, or like my brother calls it, a personal qibla, it makes it so much easier to learn, ask questions, and alhamdulillah today, even share our best practices. My curiosity led me to do more research on how Allah wanted me to behave and relate with my spouse in the home and with my children. And he gave us a sneak peek, a beautiful sneak peek on how he wants us to behave in none other than the greatest of models, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam using real life practical examples of how he lived with an emphasis of focusing on his action. Sadly, many of us focus more on the sunnah look than the sunnah way. Some of us seem more preoccupied with the external, with the looks, the symbolisms of the sunnah, and we neglect the internal and his actions. We are even selective and we take what is convenient of the sunnah that we want to practice particularly neglecting the sunnah of character. So looking at his character and his examples, I learned the beautiful stories of how he put family first. Aisha radiallahu anha was asked what the prophet used to do when he was home. And she said he would keep himself busy serving his family. And when it was time, he would get up and pray. Now many of us are so busy trying to make money so that our families will be comfortable so that they would have the best of this and that. While we miss out on developing a strong bond, we miss out on some priceless moments that we could share with them. Like I said, what guarantees do you have that you live to see another year or even another day? He was also a loving husband and a helpful husband. He helped around the home. He mended his own clothes and his shoes. 
He was also a romantic husband. Ladies, you're going to love this one. He bathed with Aisha. And Safiya was petite. She wasn't tall. When she was going to climb her camel, he would kneel down next to it. And she would put her little foot on it and climb up. I love that. And then they would eat from the same bowl. While Aisha was taking a piece of meat and she bit off of it, he picked up that same piece of meat and he bit from just where she put her lips. Oh, my husband told me to tell you all in Lagos that when he tried that stunt with me, I started shouting that I'm going to get gingivitis. <laughs> and then Aisha would also take a drink from wa of water from a bowl. And then when she puts it down, he will pick up the same bowl, turn it around to just where she put her lips, and he would drink from the same place. All right. Again, my husband said, when he tried that with me, I started shouting that I'll get cro cro. Some of these men are eyeing me. It was before. I'm reformed now. And then when Safiya was crying after she fell off her camel, he used his thumb to wipe away her tears. And she got more emotional from his kindness, so much so that she started to cry again. And you know what he did? They were moving in a caravan, and he asked all of them to stop and take a break out of consideration for her. He was so gentle. So kind. I think of the gra, gra that we show our spouse in the relationship. He also played his, his, with his wives. He raced with Aisha. And he was a loving and affectionate father and grandfather. While in Sujood, leading the companions in prayer, he stayed down for a long time. And after the prayer, the Sahaba were asking him whether he was getting a revelation. And you know what he said? He said his grandchildren were playing on his back and he didn't want to disrupt their play. Now, how many of our children feel comfortable playing on our backs or even playing with us? I have two boys, two big boys, and they're stronger than us. So if they climbed on our backs today, my husband and I would end up in hospital. But we play, and we play rough. Yes, I'm a tomboy, officially. We arm wrestle till today. We wrestle. I tell you, WWE SmackDown ain't got nothing on me. I remember growing up, my father, he was so wonderful. He used to allow my brothers and I to take turns cutting his hair. And as soon as you start, he would just fall asleep. Like when we give him a massage, as soon as you touch his feet, he falls asleep. I was a very, very naughty teenager. I was cheeky and full of mischief. And the moment it was my turn and he fell asleep, this was in the 80s, so punk era was reigning. I would do one mohawk for him. I would shave both sides and leave this one in the middle, and he's just sleeping away. And so desperately wanted to wake him up and say, can I paint it purple? But it was really so wonderful. How many play with their spouse? Today, my husband and I, yes, you may look at me, big fat mama. Yes, we race, and I can run. And we play hide and seek. I look for his trouble and I run. And because of my size, there aren't too many places I can hide in the house. But by the time I am caught, the screams, I think even my neighbors hear it. Sometimes the children start to shout, calm down, you people in the house. We show affection openly. And I think sometimes they're even jealous of us. But we are teaching them how they should relate with their spouse and how they should raise their own children. We pray together with our children. We let them hear what we pray for, and we take turns to make dua. We teach them to have a strong love for Allah and only fear offending him or displeasing him. However, we teach them not to ever fear shaitan or any jinn out there because they have absolutely no power over them. So they shouldn't give that power to them. They shouldn't give them permission to have power over them. We eat together as a family with absolutely no technology around. Yes, we put off our phones, keep them away, and we sit with no interruptions just to chat. So we talk and we talk a lot. From an early age, we started to talk about boy-girl relationship. We run a school, and what's so disturbing is the trend that they're getting more aware of members of the opposite gender from a younger and younger age. And then we talk about inappropriate physical contact with members of the opposite gender. But today, the biggest fear is contact with members of the same gender. 
Why? Because they are growing up in an era where bad is made to look okay. Bad is made to look normal. So we talk and we talk a lot and we listen to them. Even the silliest things they say, we listen. Why? Because we know if we don't, they're going to find somebody who's ready to talk and listen to them. I had to do more research on effective communication and effective listening so that I can speak to them in their language and connect with them. We let them see how we communicate. My husband and I have important discussions in their presence so that they will learn. However, we never ever fight in the presence of our children. But we teach them about the ethics of disagreement. We teach them about effective communication and effective listening. Then we make sure they watch how we take care of our parents. We visit our parents a lot. We give our parents time. Some live in a different city or town from where their parents are. But please never neglect that bond that should always stay together because they need us more than ever at this time. Be sensitive to their feelings. Show them affection and better know, do research on their best love language. Why? Because you may be doing something you think they appreciate and they want something totally different. My children see me today putting my head on my mother's lap. They see me give my parents big hugs and kisses. And they hear or watch how I listen to the stories, stories that I have memorized. But every time my parents tell me these stories, I act like I'm hearing it for the first time. As a team, as a family, we discuss how we will deal with aged parents. My father is about 93, my mother is 78, but she has dementia as well as Parkinson's, so she's quite ill. But Allah has blessed me with a gift, a husband who realizes sometimes that I am stressed because I'm not able to give them the kind of time I want to. So he and the children take turns to go hang out with my parents and give them company and chat with them. Thank your parents for the seeds they have planted in you. Pray on their behalf, pray for them. Do sadaqah on their behalf and fast for your parents. And if your parents didn't do a good job, if, they, if you feel they dropped the ball, for the sake of Allah, please forgive them. It will lighten your load. Everything in our relationship should be balanced. Relationship with our spouse, our children, and our loved ones. Fulfill your obligations to all, but don't neglect one for the other. And let your children join you when you go to visit friends or neighbors or loved ones. We do acts of charity together, community service. We plant trees together. But please, if, don't be offended if I say this. Please, please, please put down your phones and make family feel that they matter. A lot of us today are guilty of giving the unseen, those social media friends, more priority than our loved ones. We spend, based on research, no more than 25 minutes in a week on a decent family discussion. Only 25 minutes a week today. And we are so busy, yes, but we chose to get married. We chose to have children and we have obligations and we will answer to Allah for them. But we can create time during the drive to school, during bedtime. That's a great time to sit, talk, tell stories. Meal times with no technology, just to sit together and eat. And after prayers, during walks, the thing is you just have to create the time because we create time to spend time with our friends. And somehow we are able to spend hours on our phone. These are invaluable seconds that could be spent bonding with our loved ones. But be careful allowing too much time spent on television, on video games and chatting on social media. Yes, it's a convenient babysitter, but it slows down the brain and promotes passive behavior. Social media has become a great asset, but it's also become a huge burden. We see families being destroyed today because of social media. We pick up our phones the moment we wake up, even before we pray, before we say hello to our loved ones. While we're eating, we even sleep with our phones. And it stops us from being content. Why? Because wrongly, we see better versions of what we think is the dunya better versions of a car, a house, and a family, and all of a sudden we are no longer content. It starts to lower our own self-esteem. In our home, we've created boundaries and guidelines and controls for everyone. 
If you look at how you are using social media today, that is what you are teaching your children. I have been in a home where I've seen a parent communicating with their child in the same home using social media, and they will mirror what they see. If you don't control social media, social media will replace you. You really have to stand up and take control. And so many are doing a lot today to do with developing a bond and strengthening the relationship in their homes. Please continue. But like my father always says, improve upon it. Improve upon it together. Treat your home like a garden, like a team sport where everybody is having fun. Everybody is on the same side. There's mutual commitment, loyalty, gaining and growing and giving and guarding. One thing that is important about parenting is that we should be conscious of why we had those children. Sometimes we make the mistake of having them so that we can live our dreams through them, those things we couldn't achieve when we were younger. We end up dominating them and dictating how they will live their lives. You're going to be a doctor when you grow up. You're going to be an engineer. Maybe that is what was done to us growing up. But if you're going to be honest with yourself, some people are miserable today because they didn't have a choice in what they would do. Or sometimes we do everything for our children. We want them to have an easy life. We don't want them to go through the difficulties that we went through. The things that we didn't have, we want them to have. They grow up, unfortunately, with this sense of entitlement, like you owe them or society owes them. They want an easy life. We help our kids to live, but we don't prepare them to live without us because we do everything for them. They depend on us for everything. Another thing that really concerns me today is that children are not growing up hearing enough of those, that beautiful two-letter word, no. They say, I want. We say, you got it. They don't want, we don't want them to be mad at us. We don't want to be, feel guilty that we didn't give them what they want. And what do they want? They just want the latest so that they can fit in. The worst is children today are not growing up using words like excuse me, please, and thank you anymore. We are doing our children a great disservice in the name of love. So think about your children right now. Think about your spouse and your family. If you were not here today, what difference would it make? Are you teaching them to be independent? Many of us don't teach our children the value of hard work, service, sober. They get so used to receiving and collecting. Like many of you, though, you are raising your children to be well-disciplined, to have good manners, good adab. You teach them how to speak. We make a big fuss in how our children talk to one another how they talk to us, how they talk to people. We teach them good manners in how they even relate with the help. They see I hug the help. They see I chat with them. And they realize that everybody is where they are based on Allah's will. And Allah is testing us. So issues to do with respect manners is so important to inculcate with ch into children. Having said that, sometimes you do absolutely everything in your power to get this thing right, but your children may still go astray. Just because they grew up in a Muslim home doesn't mean they're going to be practicing Muslims. You gave birth to them, but you didn't give birth to their character. It all boils down to individual choice. But don't be a hardliner. Don't turn them off and don't turn them away. I got turned off growing up because I grew up in a very religious home. I learned the Quran, I learned its translation and in its interpretation. But because I was judged, society had expectations that I'm supposed to behave like so-and-so's daughter. I was condemned a lot, condemned about my dressing, my speech, my friends. And because of that, everything was haram. Oh, what you're doing is haram. Oh, Mariam, you're going to burn in hell with this thing. So I rebelled. I got allergic to anything to do with Islam. I went for almost four years in my early 20s where I stopped praying. And it wasn't until my late 20s that I rediscovered Islam. But there are so many more out there like me who are Muslims by chance. They were born in it. But today I'm a Muslim by choice. And each day I'm learning. The seeds that were planted by my parents from a very young age are what are the ones I'm seeing germinating in me. That's why I always say I'm a student, I'm not a scholar. 
But even some of the prophets couldn't guide all their children. So what we need to do is to remember that Allah says our wealth and our kids are at a trial for us. So we keep on praying and keep on planting seeds. And in addition to learning the Quran, teach your children the message of the Quran, the context of the Quran. Don't raise blind followers. Because you say read, they read. Because you say pray, they pray. This is blind following. Teach them the why behind the injunctions of the Quran. Teach them that it's very important they memorize the Quran and pronounce properly. However, it is more important for them to be conscious of Allah, to have taqwa and apply the lessons of the Quran. Don't forget, when it comes to knowledge of Allah, shaitan has more knowledge than any of us do of Allah. Shaitan knows Allah better than any of us. But what he's missing is taqwa. What he's missing is guided actions. There are scholars that know Aqidah and Tawheed, but when you look at some of their character, that is where there is a big question mark. Again, it's about the knowledge coming to life. It's about Allah being our compass. So show your children Islam in motion and hold on tight to that rope that links you, holds you to your children and hold on tight to Allah's rope. So with all my roles and responsibilities in the home, as a spouse, as a parent, I try to reflect at the end of the day to see whether I'm on track. So I do those, that gar talk with myself because those things I want to see won't happen by accident. So I try to live my life deliberately and I reflect at the end of the day and I appreciate everything that Allah has given me in a gratitude journal and in a diary. I ask myself, what did I do to grow? How did I learn? Could I have done anything differently? How did I add value to my family? What seeds did I plant? I try to remember that I'm meant to be a cheerleader to my children and to my spouse, and I reflect on that. My final words on parenting for the fathers in the house. How you treat your spouse is how you are teaching your sons to treat theirs. Your daughters are learning from you how they are meant to be treated by a man. Teach your sons to treat women with dignity and respect. Teach your sons the important qualities to look for in spouse selection and the process. Raise boys who will not just be boys. Raise boys who know that they are responsible and will be held accountable for their actions and inactions. Who understand what it means to be a real man. Raise boys who will model Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the mothers to the first schools, to the ones who educate a nation. Raise boys who grow up to treat women with respect and respect themselves, who learn to clean, cook, and do things for themselves, who are not raised to believe that women are meant to serve them as glorified house girls. Raise girls who know their role and worth in society. Raise girls who will preserve their dignity and guide your daughters in the best spouse selection. If you are so fortunate enough to see them get married, please don't interfere. If I may ask for just a few more minutes. If you are so fortunate to see your children get married, please don't interfere. Don't make them take sides. Don't make them feel guilty. Don't make life miserable for them or for their spouse. Then sometimes in spite of all your good efforts, divorce occurs. But parenting is for life. Don't make them your lawyers. Don't make them your psychiatrist. One day they will resent you. My final words on how we build a beautiful Muslim home. My husband and I and the children treat our home as a thriving garden. We put a fence around it and we guard it jealously. Everybody is planting seeds. Everybody is nurturing. Everybody is fertilizing, adding water and sunlight. And everybody is involved in removing weeds weeds starting with ourselves we smell alhamdulillah the beautiful fragrant fragrant flowers that comes from our efforts and we get to taste the beautiful fruit from our labor the fact that we are all here today means we want to be better like i said i'm a student just like you but just because we attend lecture upon lecture read books upon books they are so far from sufficient if it doesn't help us become a better parent, so we will be a better person. 
if it doesn't help us become a better spouse, a better Muslim, and if it does not translate into actions. We have more access today than ever before to knowledge and information. We have great scholars at our fingertips in our homes telling us all sorts of good things and enlightening us on Islam. But the world is not getting better. We are seeing more and more marriages break down, more absentee parents, more dysfunctional children, children that are hooked on drugs and other things. What many are suffering from is the discipline to apply the knowledge and bring it to life. So let the gifts, let the seeds that these great scholars have planted in us, the fertilizer, the sunlight, the water, nurture our hearts and our relationship and produce beautiful, delicious fruit. I am a student on a lifelong journey to learn and grow and contribute and be the best Muslim, be the best spouse and be the best parent I can be. Every day I have an opportunity to turn a new page and every day I have an op opportunity to write or rewrite my story. May what we write in our books, the deeds that we act, serve as a witness for us in the life to come. May our books be presented to us in our right hands. May Allah bless you all. I ask you to please forgive me if I have erred in any way or if I've offended anybody in any way. That is not my intention. May Allah bless the organizers for putting this great event together. And to all the speakers, those who are yet to speak and those who have already shared their wisdom and knowledge with us. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.